Hi, my name is Blair Amani. I'm the creator of Smarter in Seconds, and I'm here with Blavity to discuss mental health in the LGBTQ plus and Black community. Speaking to my own experiences with mental health as a queer person, as a bisexual woman, I think one of the most difficult things is trying to form your own identity while constantly being gaslit by society as though you don't exist. Um, recently, I had the privilege of meeting with the Biden administration around bisexual health policy. And in a lot of ways, the U.S. health system doesn't even function in a way that recognizes that bisexuals exist. So how can you understand yourself even if, if health policy won't even honor the fact you exist? Um, in, in some regards, um, LGBTQ people are told that we aren't legitimate, that we have a mental illness instead of an identity. And um, that can be really difficult. And so it's this constant ebb and flow of figuring out who you are while being told that you can't exist or that you aren't valid. Uh, and that can cause things like anxiety, that can cause things like depression. And so I think that it's important to look at the full landscape of mental health when it comes to LGBTQ plus identity and not just say, oh, LGBTQ plus people have higher instances of depression or anxiety, but to instead look at why is that? It's because we're constantly being gaslit. I think some unique um, difficulties that LGBTQ plus people have when it comes to mental health is being believed and understood. I mean, you, you sit in a therapist's office if you can get access to a therapist, because in the United States, it can be quite difficult to have that mental health access. So you're in your therapist's office, which is already a journey to get to, and you start talking about your ex-girlfriend, or you start talking about your current boyfriend as, as a queer person. And you have people who will completely interrupt the session by trying to address those things. There's this this medicalization of uh, queerness where it's not something to be respected or honored in some spaces, but something to be cured or fixed. Um, our transgender and gender queer siblings go through this immensely. Um, you know, queer folks go through this um, as far as being forced to pray the gay away or change themselves in order to be legitimate in society. And all that has immense mental health consequences. I think one of the things I'm often saying around mental health care is that we can see throughout history that where the harm comes in as it relates to queer identity is when people are forced to not be themselves. That's where the harm comes in. That's where you see psychological trauma. That's where you see just uh, the devastation of people being denied the opportunity to be themselves, which is one of the most fundamental things uh, in society. And I think the way that we can support this more is, you know, when we look at, through different pop culture celebrities, like, uh, like Lil Nas X, for example, I think it was very telling to see the shift that we've had as a community to recognize Lil Nas X as as, you know, a gay rapper, a queer rapper who is open about himself. And that maybe wasn't the same, you know, grace that was given to other uh, queer artists. Um, we have Big Frida, who's a fixture of, you know, the, the hip hop and, and bounce community. And I think she is accepted in a way that is a constant shift versus how Lil Richard was treated or how, you know, Prince's very clear gender queerness was, was on display, even if he didn't claim that identity for himself. So I think it starts with examining how we talk about these things in um, non-personal spaces when it has to do with celebrities and then bringing it to the personal and shutting down those conversations that medicalize or stigmatize queer identity as though it is a mental health issue and then validly discussing the mental health issues that come out of being treated that way not as something that a person needs to go through by themselves but honoring it um, as a community effort because you know, we wouldn't have to come out if we were not constantly assumed to be something else. If we instead had a world where people could just express themselves, talk about their mental health struggles, talk about their experiences, instead of the expectation being that I have to tell you who I am and until then you feel like I'm lying to you, we're not gonna get anywhere. And so I think that's changing slowly but surely, but we could always use more of it. So the systemic issues that are facing LGBTQ plus people are immense. Um, one, to just have legitimacy and access to healthcare. But I'll give a specific example. Um, recently, as I, I mentioned, I was able to meet with the Biden administration around bisexual health policy. And if, the, if we use the example of uh, domestic violence as, as an example, say you're a bisexual woman and you have been dating a man and you've broken up with that man and you're now with a woman. 
Well, because of the biphobia in society and the sexism in society, you may have an experience where that former male partner is coming after you and your current, you know, woman partner. And what we see when it comes to accessing healthcare, accessing resources, accessing shelters, is that you would be turned away from a straight shelter because you're currently with a woman, and you'll also be turned away from a queer shelter, potentially, because your former partner is a man. And so that's a perfect example of how people are falling through the gaps of care and of access, and that has to do with domestic violence. Now, domestic violence isn't just happening in a vacuum. It's not just physical violence. It's also extremely psychological, the care that you can access at shelters that you know need constantly more support and more access to care. And so it's taking these different, you know, bi plus coalitions to come into the, the, the administration, to come into the healthcare infrastructure and say, hey, we're here, we're legitimate, and we need access to care. Instead, what we see is uh, reporting on bisexual women having higher rates of mental illness. Instead of saying bisexual women experience discrimination, bisexual women experience uh, intimate partner violence because of biphobia, not because they're bisexual, and really shifting that narrative so that way we're not putting the onus and the blame on the individual themselves, and then doing that on an institutional level so that we have doctors and medical experts who are trained on how to address these issues without siloing people or dismissing people in their identities. It's honoring the fact that uh, or acknowledging the fact that the United States um, American Psychological Association until the 1970s looked at uh, gay identity, looked at queerness as a mental illness. And there's still a lot of people who look at it that way. We have conversion therapy being very widespread in the United States, which is not therapeutic at all. It's ab abuse where people are forced to change who they are in order to become cured or fixed. And those are horrible things. And so it's recognizing that we have people who need mental health care. Uh, we also have people who have been mistreated by the mental health care infrastructure and that if we don't uh, redress those things, then we can't get to caring for people because we're not even honoring their humanity. We're not honoring the history and we're not working to undo that harm. It's very similar to what we experienced just across the black community with medical care of distrusting the medical system because we have a reason to distrust. And so I think within the queer community uh, for black queer folks and for queer folks of all identities, it's that same kind of distrust, but also the infrastructure structure not accommodating us or acknowledging us or doing that work to overcome that history. I think that one of the most important things in an LGBTQ plus person's life or anybody's life for that matter is the access to community. And so how do we create that infrastructure? How do we create those safe spaces for people who might not come from affirming families? One thing that is fundamental to Black identity within the United States is creating chosen family, found family. We've had to do this since chattel slavery where we didn't know our families because we were separated. Um, if you look at these documents following Reconstruction when slavery was ended, uh, except for as punishment for a crime with the 13th Amendment, you're seeing people saying, this was my sister. Where, what plantation is she at? Where is she now? And so it's that family building in those non-traditional ways that's fundamental to Blackness. And in that way, it's also fundamental to queerness and the intersections thereupon of being able to say, yeah, I was born into a family or a circumstance where I'm not accepted, but that doesn't mean that I'm destined to not be accepted. It means that I can build that community myself. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that we can all be allies to one another, regardless of the identities that you hold. You can always show up for somebody else in a different way. And so in that regard, the ways that you show up can be to harm that person or it can be to heal that person. Um, healing doesn't just happen in a therapist's office where you're sitting one to one, laying on an ottoman, talking to somebody about your feelings. It can be addressing those harms. It can be, hey, you know, growing up, I made a lot of fun of you because you were more feminine. Well, I really want to apologize for that, especially now that I know you're gay. It's taking that onus upon yourself to recognize the harm that you did and recognize the healing that you can do. And I think that's something innate in the humanity of, of, of individuals. And when we look at mental health infrastructure, it's not just going to a building or to an office. It's about healing in public together of, you know, standing up for somebody as they come out to their family, being their family if their family, you know, their biological family doesn't accept them. Those are all tangible things that cost zero money to do because it's literally just your energy, your love and, and your empathy.
So as somebody who has been on a mental health journey since I was literally eight years old, I have some practical tips for how you work through your mental health journey, how you identify it and how you move forward for LGBTQ plus folks in particular. One of the first things is to recognize where those feelings come from. This individualistic society that we have is so preoccupied with placing the spotlight on the individual. What's your problem? Now it's your, you know, it's now your responsibility to create a solution. And yes, there is that responsibility aspect, but where are those issues coming from? I think looking at the broader issues that we're attached to is fundamental in any healing journey because then you can stop and think, hmm, it's not my fault that I'm feeling this way. It's not my fault that I have mental health struggles, but it is my responsibility to work through them, but to recognize that it's not a personal failure. It's an opportunity to grow, to become your best self and, and to learn. Uh, I think another practical tip is to look at the full range of care options, medication, therapy, talk therapy, sensory integration therapy. Um, there's just so many different things that we can do to accommodate ourselves and to be able to get through life in a way that's not painful or as difficult as it might be otherwise if we're not accommodated. So the first thing being um, to like, let me like, so you can like chop it up and go back to my intro and then start here, sorry. Um, the first thing being is to not feel a sense of blame or fault for who you are or for your mental health struggles or for your queer identity. Guilt is something that is very hard to work through, especially if that's the type of environment you grew up in, but it doesn't help you heal. So removing yourself from that guilt, maybe identifying the circumstances, the context, the systems of oppression that have resulted in your suffering, and then being able to say, hey, it's not on me. Uh, it might be on me to heal, but it's not on me that I'm in this position in the first place. So that's one. Two is to look at the full range of options, um, whether it's medication, therapy, uh, changing your lifestyle. Um, for example, a relative of mine has very severe depression and he learned that actually he had the highest dose that he could be on for his depression medication. And he actually has to work out to get those, mo to get more endorphins, to be able to like, you know, get through life. And part of that came from being bullied as a queer young person. And so it's recognizing that there's no one size fits all uh, anxiety. There's no one size fits all depression. You have to go on your own journey, but learning from other people and accommodating yourself and doing so unapologetically is key. And I think the third thing is don't feel like you have to explain yourself. I can respect you and I don't have to understand your identity. And sometimes it's hard for us to demand that respect back or to move through the world in a way where we are not apologizing for ourselves because we've been forced to for potentially your entire life. So to recognize that I don't need you to understand what bisexuality means to me or what anxiety or ADHD means to me. I just need you to know that this is how I'm accommodating myself. This is who I am. And that as a human being, just like you, I'm deserving of respect. So I think those three things are key. And it's really just about self-preservation because there's so many variables in the world that we can't control. Sometimes we can't even control ourselves or our mental health. So the best thing we can do is try to accommodate ourselves and to give ourselves forgiveness, love, and to fight through that guilt that you might feel. Oh, definitely. Um, so when it comes to LGBTQ plus identity, this doesn't exist in a silo. There are other marginalized identities, ability, class, um, access, um, race. There's just so many different factors. For myself, being a Muslim woman, religion, a lot of people have different aspects of trauma or can't even get access within the LGBTQ plus community itself because of existing anti-blackness or ableism or, you know, anti-religious bias that might even come from a place of pain for many people with uh, religious trauma. So working through those things and recognizing, again, that we can always be allies to one another. We can always be, you know, if you're the person who's invited to the table, it's about recognizing who's being left behind and not speaking on their behalf, but making sure that you're passing the mic so that person can advocate for themselves, recognizing that there's no people who are voiceless, but instead people who are silenced in the metaphorical sense and sometimes in the very little, the literal sense. So I think that um, there's just always a story people have. Identities are not static or stagnant. Um, myself being a bisexual Muslim woman, that's my unique experience. That's still my Blair Amani experience. It doesn't mean it's going to be the exact same experience of a, another bisexual Muslim woman. It means that we might have some similarities and commonalities. We might have resources that we could both benefit from, but fundamentally, identities don't mean that you suddenly take on a, a monolithic identity. That's why Blavity was started, I remember way back, when it was just to discuss 
that blackness is not a monolith, just like queerness is not a monolith, disability is not a monolith, religion is not a monolith. And so I think so long as you move through the world in a way where you're recognizing that your complexities just mirror somebody else's complexities, that as complex of a person you are, everybody else is, we all have our own stories. And the metaphor I try to use, and I think it's very good in organizing spaces, is that if we can understand our identities as different petals on the flower of who we are, that when we come together, we are creating a bouquet. And we need to arrange ourselves in a way that honors our talents, that creates space for people. If you grew up being a well-nourished sunflower, maybe you need to take a step back so that, you know, the little hydrangeas can have their moment as well. And so it's thinking about all those things coming together in this garden of life and trying to maximize your privilege and your access and your resources, not only for your own benefit, for the benefit of other people, whether they're like you or whether they're not. But I think one of the toughest things that we have to work through uh, in various communities is recognizing that just because you have one perspective on what an identity is, doesn't mean that there's not going to be variations on that and that you have to make space for it. And sometimes that space means making that space within your own heart by fighting through your own biases. Just because somebody's you know, LGBTQ+, doesn't mean that they don't have anti-LGBTQ plus beliefs because we are all socialized in these systems of harm, which means we all have to heal from them in order to be better human beings to one another. Ooh, I'm gonna get spicy on this one. Okay. So if you really want to be a better human being to people, then how do allies and accomplices help to be that? How do mental health professionals help to be that, to be there for people, to be allies and accomplices for LGBTQ plus people? I think one of the first things is to question and to critically think through the assumptions that you carry and that you've been told and that you've been taught. Right now we're seeing these uh, immense and sweeping bans on uh, you know, gender affirming care, on drag queens, and it's all under the guise of trying to control people's gender expression, just like we're seeing with the bans on uh, you know, reproductive care to control people's bodies, to dictate who has a baby and when, and that in many you know states increasingly, that if you are pregnant, you're giving birth unless you can get out of that state. So we're in these terrifying times. And where are all these things coming from? The assumptions that a certain class of people has the right to care for a certain uh, other class of people, that they can dictate, that they can be paternalistic. Sometimes we carry that within ourselves because we've internalized those belief systems because we've all been taught it. You know, if we're socialized in a white supremacy, that means that we're also going to have folks who are harmed by white supremacy being people who are agents of white supremacy because you're socialized through that, just like homophobia, just like transphobia. And so I think for mental health professionals in particular, it's incredibly important to check yourself before you wreck yourself when it comes to discussing uh, different identities that you might not be a part of, being extremely open to say, Saying, I'm not sure about that. Let me move forward. I've done uh, quite a few trainings with different mental health practitioners, uh, therapists, psychiatrists, etc., on how to talk around gender, how to talk around, you know, sexual trauma, how to talk around sexuality, sexual orientation, and you don't have to have an identity to provide care for somebody who's from a different identity but what you do have to have is humility to have you know the death of your own ego to recognize that just because i am in a position of power doesn't mean that i know better for this person or know better for their life i'm there to help them i'm there to be an accomplice and an ally in their own healing journey and to show up in the ways that i'm asked to show up so those things are incredibly important Question those assumptions and biases that you may hold. Recognize where they come from. Move straight from guilt to fixing it, to recognizing it, to healing from it. And, and recognize that just because you're in a position of power um, and, and that really being on a mental health journey with somebody isn't shouldn't, shouldn't involve a power dynamic, even though sometimes it does, but it should be a healing dynamic. It should be a mutual respect dynamic. Um, and I think also for LGBTQ plus folks, help uh, the allies be allies, help the accomplices be accomplices by, you know, speaking up. Of course, they have to make space for us to be able to do that. But know that sometimes there are people in your corner. So many of us go through the experience of constantly feeling like we're fighting for our lives. We're battling, uh, especially for folks who have, you know, the battle wound, psychological or physical of bullying trauma, religious trauma, etc. But recognize that sometimes we can trust people, that it is healthy and important to trust people again, to be on your side. But fundamentally, that starts with loving and trusting yourself. And if you can't get there yet, respecting yourself, because that will carry you through.